<laughs> okay, th thank you very much, um, um, everyone, for coming along. I think it's always, uh, for me, a real pleasure to always come along to events where um, open-minded, open source, open standards, open technology people, open working people get together. Um, these events are always um, uh, very open and generous. They're, they're not like um, some events where uh, they're, they're sales events in disguise, really. Uh, one of the great things about this community is we, we're not shy about sharing and learning from each other. Um, and I, I always learn something new when I, when I go to an open source uh, event. I'm, I'm Tariq Rashid, for, um, uh, for those who um, didn't know. Um, I currently work at the Home Office, but I'm speaking in a personal capacity today. Um, I hope um, some of my experience over the last few years is useful to, to, to someone. Um, I, back in 2011, 2012, uh, I made a lot of noise around open source in government. Um, there were very dark days then. Open source was feared. It wasn't understood. There were lots of myths around. People feared you know, security myths. Um, government wasn't very open to uh, different kinds of suppliers. Um, there was, there, you know, it's well recognized there were a small number of um, pretty large suppliers in government, and we wanted to diversify that to smaller businesses, but different kinds of businesses with different kinds of business model. I was lucky enough to be involved in um, the open standards effort, um, and so on and so on. I uh, won't, <laughs> won't ramble on. Um, it's lovely, uh, Hebden Bridge, isn't it? <laughs> My aunt's in Halifax, but I haven't told her I'm here because uh, she'll want me to visit and I have to rush back to London this afternoon. Um, brilliant. So what I want to do today is talk um, not just about open source, but a broader uh, set of questions um, around how open source might be used. And I think they're useful for um, technologists um, those who work with open source to understand the context in which their technology uh, is going to be uh, used, um, experimented with, played with, um, and become useful. Um, I think it's always worth having that broader context because it can better guide how you um, develop your technology, how you propose your technology, how you engage and talk to people, particularly in government. This thing called digital, it's, um, you know, everyone's talking about it. Um, it's a big thing at the moment. Uh, it's probably a buzzword, but that's okay. There's some useful things within that buzzword. So I'll talk a little bit about what that means because that really governs how, how particularly in government, uh, we, we think about designing solutions involving technology. I'll talk about how that resonates with open source, whether there's a good fit or not. Um, you won't be surprised to hear that there is, but, um, but I'll, I'll talk about some of those ways. Uh, in which open source really enables digital. Um, and then I'll finish off with um, just some of my own thoughts around how open source businesses um, might want to um, either present their technology or, or develop their technology in ways that make it easier for those who develop digital services to take that technology. Uh, it's just my own personal opinion. Um, it, I can't tell you how to run your, your services, your businesses but it's, it's based on my experience over the last few years, and I hope, hope some of that is useful to you. Um, I, I should say I do um, rub it on a bit sometimes, so stick your hand up if, I, uh, if I'm nearing the finishing line. <laughs> Brilliant. So what is digital? Um, is it ones and zeros? Um, I think it's a valid question to ask, you know. Why is everyone talking about digital? We've always had digital, right? Um, is it this stuff? Is it, is it all these cool, trendy, uh, websites and services that are online, is, is that digital? Are we all supposed to hook up to YouTube and LinkedIn in order to compose and build services? Does it mean working on the web? Again, these are all really valid questions. And actually, I, I have to be honest and say, I think the word digital perhaps is a bit of a misnomer because when you actually do it and experience it, um, it's really about something else. Um, yes, uh, working on the web is important. Uh, yes, you know, removing paper processes is important, um, but, but there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a deeper and wider ethos around digital. And, and I've come to the conclusion, um, having worked building and developing digital services and assessing them, that it's actually, it, it's, it's a culture, it's a mindset, and it's a mindset that really puts users at the start, at the middle, at the end, at the centre of everything we do. That may sound like it's an obvious statement, but actually, 
uh, organizations, particularly large organizations, get into habits of repeating processes, project management, ticking boxes, doing procurements, you know, doing testing and so on and so on. And in, in all the enthusiasm for doing IT, doing technology, doing procurements, building stuff, deploying it, sometimes we forget about users. And actually, digital really is about shifting and refocusing what we do, everything we do, whether it's coding, whether it's testing, even whether it's continuous integration, it's really about being responsive to users. I can't stress that enough. It's about users. At the start of any initiative, we have to think about what is it that users need? What is it that they need to get done? And that's a really good question. Why? Keep asking why. Why do I need to renew my passport? Why do I need to submit this form? Keep asking why, and you'll get to the root of why you think you need to build something. Once you've understood that, we're then into designing user experiences which are efficient, optimal, pleasant. Pleasant even, yeah. <laughs> um, what it's not about is an organization's needs. It's not about being it's not about developing systems and solutions which are convenient for the organization. And that's sometimes not a distinction that people have in mind. It still happens today. We're all kind of learning. But too often, particularly large established organizations, they take their internal structure, their internal habits, their internal ways of working, their internal IT systems, and they impose them on users. We've always done it this way, or that's how the HR system works, or you've got to, you know, you've got to submit uh, this form or this bit of information into system X, Y, and Z, and that's what we expose to users. Digital is about separating that away and hiding that from users, so users only experience just enough of your organization, because they don't really love your organization. You know, they just want to get on with their daily lives. If you can make your experience, your interaction pleasant, great. Um, but not everyone likes renewing their driving license. Um, so we have to make that as efficient and as pleasant as possible. And that's only done by understanding users, understanding what their daily lives are like. Uh, I'll give you an example. Um, there are some offices um, which are open nine to five, and they support those who care for others. But actually, if you th try and talk to, sit with, observe those carers, you realize they haven't got time <laughs> nine to five to go to offices. Um, they, they can't interact with the state in nine to five. They finish at midnight. So it's those kinds of insights which drive the design of your solutions. It's about stepping outside your organization and looking back in. I love this phrase. It's outside in thinking, not inside out. And for some of us who've worked in the, um, in the industry for many years, this is a bit, of a, a bit of a Copernican revolution. It's users that are at the center of the universe, not the project manager, not the IT system, not Apache, <laughs> not Drupal. It's users. And I have to say, you know, 10 years ago, I wasn't thinking like this. And I'm glad I kind of had my head kind of knocked into shape. But this is also important. We measure the success of what we do, not by CPU utilization or how many projects we managed to complete in six months or whether we came under budget or not, although that is important. It's about whether users are satisfied with the services they're using. That's what's important. I can have really great data centers. I can have brilliantly colored Cat5 cable. I can have my systems designed entirely with open source at very low cost. That's nice. That's great. But if it's not good for users, it doesn't really work. But digital has another side to it, which is that it really recognizes that we're all human. Developers are human. Um, technologists are human. Users are human. It recognizes we're not all the same. It recognizes we make errors. 
It recognizes that when I talk to you, I may miscommunicate, you may misunderstand. Users might change their mind um, about what they need or want. Their lives may change. A really important um, thing about digital development, I'm trying not to use the word agile, <laughs> is <coughs> it recognizes there's a human scale of complexity which we can deal with. That means we try to work in small teams, we try to work in small technology units, we try to modularize the way we build services. Digital development is, is the antithesis of big, monolithic, you know, hundreds of people style projects, because those things go wrong. <coughs> they go wrong because we're human. There is such a thing as a human scale. <coughs> so what we used to do um, is we'd all huddle around and we'd set up a project. Um, we have a project manager and we'd, we'd kind of write really detailed requirements because we thought 900 pages of requirements must be right. Um, we'd quickly get onto procurement because um, it took a long time and it's painful. Um, we'd, we'd sometimes outsource all this stuff. In fact, we outsourced it quite a lot in those days. Um, and at the end of it, we hoped that what popped out the other end was what we needed. Um, and for all the many factors that could go wrong from here to here, they usually did. People miscommunicated, the world changed, users, got it, users expressed what they needed in different ways or they, it wasn't understood. Um, technology moved on. Um, things got cheaper, but we were, praising, we were paying prices from five years ago, and so on and so on. Uh, you know, I could, sp I could spend you know, probably an hour talking about all the things that could go wrong. But the point is, that's a massive bet you're making that this thing at this end um, pops out right. But you don't need to. If, you're, if, there's, en if there's engineers or scientists in the room, you, 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 actually, I find that some of the best sort of technologists are those with a bit of an engineering mindset because they recognize the world is real, things break, things are fragile, things change. And what that means is we take a, a more scientific, actually, believe it or not, approach to developing services. We say, let's try it. Let's experiment. Let's test a concept. Let's keep the cycle short. Let's not commit too much. Let's observe. Let's adapt. Let's refine. Start small and grow. This is all relevant to open source, by the way. I'll get to that. <laughs> and, and why not? It sounds so obvious, but we didn't do that. And it means that at any point in time, you can change direction in response to what you found or learned. You can correct. If I sent you all into a dark room with no lights, you wouldn't be running around at 100 miles an hour in one path. You'd be feeling your way around. You'd be tiptoeing. You'd be putting your hands out. You hit something. You change direction. It's kind of what it's like when you're building, building sort of significant services. And that's, n that's nothing wrong with doing that. It's actually quite intelligent. Jump a bit there. So I want to just underline this point again. Happy users, that's where value is created. Yes, we like open source. Yes, we like SMEs. Yes, we like efficient data centers. Yes, we like sort of you know, great usage of memory and CP and all that good stuff. But if it doesn't work for users, all that investment is potentially wasted. You know, it's better to have happy users who can get what they need done with some horrible technology than have some beautiful technology which we love that just doesn't work for users. That's, that's important. I should say, um, based on my experience helping others do digital, it's not really about taking parts of a process and getting rid of bits of the paper in it. It's not about digitizing parts. Uh, that's why I don't really like the word digital because it, it has connotations of getting rid of paper. Yes, it is about that, but it's, it's about so much more than that. It's really about taking the opportunity to step outside and reimagining what those services could be like in the 21st century in 2015 and crafting them for those users. But before you can do that, you need to understand those users. And it's okay to have different kinds of users. They're not all the same. Some may not be great with English. Some may be scared of computers. Some may live in parts of Scotland where there's no much connectivity, and so on and so on. But if we're crafting services, if we're designing them, 
it means we do have to care about other things now. We have to care about visual design, content design, what's the language we're using, what's the appearance of the service to the user. That's important and actually makes a difference and you can observe that if you make the effort. User experience, we care about that and that means bringing in different kinds of skills to the teams that build services. And for me, this is one I can't sort of make enough noise about. Too often we kind of get enthused about building services and pushing them out and firing them and saying, ta-da, it's gone live. But actually it's really important, particularly from an architectural perspective, to make sure that your services can change, that they're adaptive, because the world does not stop. You know, the world hasn't frozen when you've clicked go live. Users change, their needs change, their behaviours change, technology changes, prices change, new things appear on the market. So you need to design your services to change. And that's really important. Uh, and actually, you know, I have to say we're, um, I still have a job on my hands convincing architects to design in ways that gives them flexibility in six months' time, in five years' time. I think that's really important. And actually, open source is really helpful to that. All right, OK, we get it. We've talked enough about, um, about um, um, digital design and so on. But what about open source? So rather than sort of list out um, um, you know, um, uh, a match or not match kind of uh, table, why don't we just ask ourselves a few questions and think through them? So one of the big th important things about the digital approach is that it delivers value to users quickly. You, know, you don't disappear for six months or, or two years uh, and, and, and sort of come back with some kind of answer. If you the, the, it's really important to start some or deliver something to the user so that they can start experimenting with it, trying it, so you can start understanding whether it works, so you can quickly get onto refining it. Can I do that if I've got a six month procurement process because I've got to buy some expensive technology? Well, if I can just get some open source to knock out a prototype, that's much better, isn't it? And that's what we're learning to do. We, our time to deliver sort of initial experimental prototypes has gone down from months to a week or less, you know. That's, that's, for us, that's massive. Actually, it's, it's uh, that point about changeability. It's also way easier to change solutions which are built out of open source components than it is if they're built out of monolithic COTS products. There is a role for COTS products, clearly. But if we've tried to mangle and kind of force together, I don't know, Microsoft Dynamics speaking from experience with other things, it's not so easy. I can't respond quickly. And actually, <laughs> I, I, I do assessments of digital services, and one of the things that people get stuck on is when I say, well, if, if something needed to change, um, and I usually give an example, how quickly can you make that change live? If it's weeks, they've probably have done it wrong. If it's that afternoon, that's, usually, that's a good sign, and they're usually using open technology to do that. Sorry, I'm giving you guys uh, headaches here. Where am I? Uh, yeah, this, this is again a really important point. We should be able to experiment and try new things that we've not tried before. That's risky, but it shouldn't be that risky. If I have to spend lots of money and effort and process to get my hands on some technology, to try a different way of doing things? I'm either not going to bother or I'm going to do it and think, oh my god, that didn't work quite so well, but I'm going to have to stick with it because it's politically uh, not very nice to say, sorry guys, we bought all those expensive database licenses or we've, we've bought into some you know, you know, meaningful kind of commitment to, to a supplier here. I can't just turn my back on that. If you need and you should uh, want to try experiment um, try new ways of 
solving a problem. You need technology which doesn't commit to you. And again, open source is really helpful for that because you can try it, and if you don't like it, you can dump it. We also have to recognize that what we do covers a spectrum of, of risk and impact and, and importance, I guess. Some things um, really have to be rock solid, stable, backed up by lots of assurance, you know, so that we can all sleep at night. And that's fine, because if it goes wrong, bad things happen, fine. And then there's stuff which is not so kind of scary, and there's stuff which really isn't scary at all. But we shouldn't be paying the same and treating that technology as if it was all the scary, expensive stuff. We have to recognize there's a spectrum. In the past, we've built our stuff, whether it was just an intranet site or a sort of a life critical system, using the most expensive technology, you know, wrapped with the most kind of, you know, suffocating support. And that's wrong. That, that didn't recognize that there was that spectrum. And in fact, the distribution works for us. There's lots of stuff that isn't that critical. The critical stuff, there's, 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 there's a few bits. It means we can spend a lot less and worry a lot less with the rest of the stuff. My, my intranet site shouldn't cost me 14 million pounds a year, or was it 1.4? Whichever one of those it is, it's wrong, because it's not that critical. And open source allows flexibility and creativity, actually, in how it, that stuff is priced, how support is designed around it. I can have open source which is backed up by really serious um, service. Or, if it's not that important, I can open so have open source, which is backed up by kind of an intermediate level of support, or no support, and that's OK. And that matches the real world in which I'm working. I think it's bouncing this signal, and it's getting it twice. <coughs> One of the nice things that's happened in government um, is that we have, I, th I, you know, I think it's a great thing, given how, where we were five years ago. We want to share what we've done, um, and there's many reasons for that. Um, it's, it's partly about you know, the taxpayers paid for it. You know, why should it be closed and trapped inside an organization? Um, but actually, um, it, you know, like in other sectors, when people share and open about what they've done, those ecosystems are really vibrant and effective. Um, you know, we've got a lot to learn from the open source community, which by default talks openly and publicly about what it's working on. And, and there's, you know, there's, there's nothing to be defensive about. You know, it's, it, it means that people can find um, uh, contacts. Who's working on this IPsec daemon? Or who's the expert on something in particular? Or oh, that's an interesting bit of code. Or how did they solve that? And if it's all open and accessible, that makes for a much better ecosystem where the right solutions emerge. Um, there's a lot less kind of you know, unnecessary duplication. Um, there's less kind of reinventing the wheel. Uh, and that's great. Um, and you can have a network effect where the best stuff has a community kind of attracted to it. And it shoots, you know, it accelerates. You know. I don't need to tell people, you know, Linux is a great example of that. But there's many other examples. And if we're developing solutions which are built out of open source components, then it's so much easier for us to just pop it online. We don't have to go through the hassle and sometimes you know, barriers um, if we're not using open technology. So it's a very natural fit. If we want to be open and share our solutions, open works. There's a, there's a cost side to that as well. It doesn't cost someone else um, to use something that I've built if it's built out of open, open source technology. If I built something with proprietary technology and explained how it works and put that online, fine. But, but others can't then take that because they maybe don't have, have the funds and the resources and maybe they don't want to, to do, use that. One of the things that I really um, um, spent a, a fair bit of time on was trying to um, broaden um, government's approach to the market so that it talked to and engaged with different kinds of businesses, um, not just open source suppliers, but them as well. Um, 
smaller companies, companies with different kinds of business model. But smaller companies have less budget, you know. Um, some of you may be kind of, you know, individual kind of um, professionals. Um, if, if, if government as a customer is more open to open source, it's more open to suppliers who want to use open source. If, if government said we are only going to use the most expensive database on the market, then SME suppliers find that much harder to engage with. You're going to have to buy it and work with it. That's horrible. Whereas if you want to get started, if you're perhaps an established SME, it's less costly and easier for you to work with open source. And if we're ready to accept that, that's great. That may not sound like a big thing, but actually um, um, the message that that sent out in the market was quite powerful. It said, you can be an SME and we're not going to impose costs on you because we are happy to talk about you using open source to build your services for us. And going back to that point I made earlier around designing and crafting services and not imposing what comes out of the box on the user, that means that it's much easier to craft those solutions if the technology I'm using is more like Lego. If the technology I'm using is more like Lego, it means I can compose those solutions so they're the right size, the right mix, or, 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 com or composed of technologies from different projects and different suppliers. One of the things that gets lost sometimes is, 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 is the user interface and that experience. And technology which decouples what it does at core from how it presents and inter interacts with the users, if that's separated, decoupled, it means we can much more easily craft those user interfaces. We've had some really tough time with COTS products on the market not being able to have a different skin put on them, which means they're imposing what they think the user needs on our users, and that's not so great. Um, I'm just thinking, for example, say, let's say, you know, let's say Alfresco. I can have a, my own skin, my own user interface, talking back to you know, a, a, a business engine, whether that's Alfresco or whether that's something else. So that kind of modularity is really helpful. It's really important that I can get out my information. I don't want to just use the method that the COTS product has said I must use to either control the software, access functions, or get out the data. Unfortunately, some technology hides the data, hides my business information. That's bad for me. I want to always be able to get at that in a way that's reusable. That means I need to get that information out so that I can change supplier, change technology. Uh, and, and most of you know that proprietary products like to hide and lock down and close away your information. Once you're in, you, it's not easy to get out. And open source doesn't really have a reason to hide your information. Um, and that's great for us because it means we can either get out that information, um, and if increasingly uh, open source technology is providing nice open APIs to get out that information or, or some of the functions and allow us to compose and build solutions in ways that we want not just how the original developers thought we should be using that technology. Yep. Five minutes, OK. And it's important that we're able to chain supply. You know, if, if I'm not happy with a, a particular product as well, um, or a supplier, uh, or a provider of support, because there's no monopoly really over open source, it means there's a greater um, um, ecosystem of those who can provide it, those who can support it, those who can, who can help you with it. It's an order of magnitude more diverse, and that's great for us. It is more choice, more competition, and that's important. And, and all the new kids who are coming and, and, and joining our organizations, they're increasingly using open source tools. Um, statisticians and data scientists don't want to use SAS and S plus and those kinds of tools. They're all using Python and Pandas and NumPy and all, 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 all those tools which have really taken over the data science sort of uh, discipline. 
But actually, if we take a big step back, almost all technology is, you know, inevitably becoming more and more open as it becomes more and more commoditized, as the secrets to how it works dis dissipate, really. And today, you've got to the point where actually it's very hard to introduce new technologies into the market, which, which, which are closed. Um, we've had Google introducing Kubernetes, and they didn't have to make it open. But in order to compete with what was already out there, they made the calculation that actually it would get more of a kind of uh, an adoption and, and more calmer, I guess, in some sense, um, if it was open. Even Apple um, has said it will open source Swift. Um, so we're in a very different environment today where um, things are marching towards being open. You know, back in the old days, you know, web application servers cost the, cost the price of a house. Um, and now, because of open source, it's really difficult to maintain a high price. It's difficult to maintain sort of a secrecy about how they work. So yes, people do use proprietary products at school and university, but that is changing. And, and the education system, I'm really pleased to say, has shifted people away from learning products and learning to buy those products to actually learning how technology works. And that's, that's a really important shift. So, Digital loves open source, and open source really enables digital. Like all those things we talked about, responsiveness, being able to craft services, being able to try things quickly, low risk, low commitment, uh, being able to change, being able to kind of change suppliers, being able to re-kind of configure and refactor what you've done. Open source really matches the digital way of working, and that's, that's really what I wanted to say today. Very quickly, um, just some of the thoughts I've had over the last five or six years around working with open source and some of the trends I'm seeing. I hope you'll give me a minute to kind of go through this really quickly as I think some, some businesses may, may be interested. Um, open core, I really had trouble with it because what it means is the useful functions are not as easily accessible um, as, as the open parts. Um, I can't tell you how to run your business, that's fine. My own experience is that if it's all easily accessible, I can just as easily experiment, play with, try, iterate. Whereas if I've got to go through some hoops to get at the closed parts, whether it's procurement, whether it's signing documents, it just makes it a little bit harder. And I, I, I found that I work best with organizations that make their money from providing a great service. Um, I don't, don't try and kind of, you know, um, keep the best bits um, proprietary. But that, you know, opinions vary. That's, that's my experience. Um, open source, which provides APIs and access to functions, works really well for us now because we can choose how to interact with that technology, not just how the developers originally envisaged it. If you're developing open source, that's, that's really worth keeping in mind and getting at that data, make that easy. Keep it modular. I'm not talking about launch D or whatever it is. Uh, I'm, I'm talking about, you know, think of Lego bricks. And, and allow the end developer or the end user to compose their solutions. Because otherwise, you're making a bet, which you're probably going to get wrong, about how the technology is going to be used. Keep your options open. This is something that's really interesting. When we develop digital services, it's really important for us, particularly after the stuff goes live, to keep understanding an eye on how users are actually using that service. Does that service still meet their needs after go live, before go live, five months after go live, two years after go live? And that means monitoring their interaction and their journey through that service. So I found that technology, which allows me to monitor the user experience, the user journeys, is much easier to work with. It's not about, it's not just about measuring CPU and memory and disk I.O. It's about being able to monitor user journeys. And if your solutions can allow that, log that, visualize that, that, that really works. Because it's one of the things that really fails. Um, and I'm going to upset some people when I say this, but the open source world is not short of technical capability and, and generosity. But it hasn't had quite the same amount of, um, I guess, user research and design kind of skills, which means some of the software, particularly if it's user in facing, um, it's a bit ugly, actually. Um, and actually, sadly, that matters. 
Um, I know many of us are technologists and we kind of you know, don't worry so much about that or it doesn't, we can learn to use technology. But for the vast majority of users out there who are not technological, it matters. And I think going forward, anyone who can put some effort into the design and the user experience, I'm think, let's just say LibreOffice, for example, you know, I know they're putting some effort now into its, its appearance and design, and that will really pay off because most people just want to achieve a few simple things and overloading them with all sorts of icons and things, it doesn't work so well. I think actually there's a real gold mine there if you can get that right. I will stop now. Um, I think the future is bright for open source. That's my daughter. She's playing with a Raspberry Pi. The Linux command line up there. Um, she's learning Python. And, and this is really important. Uh, we're going to have a generation of people who know how technology works and weren't trained to buy vendor products. Thank you very much.